Hello, welcome to Moose Tech Connect's virtual conference session, Cemetery Research 102, Gathering Cemetery and Headstone Data. I'm LaDonna Garner, and I'm glad to be with you today to discuss several techniques to gain family history from cemeteries. Attached with this video is a simple handout to add to your notebook with helpful tips on planning your first or next cemetery visit. So let's get to the fun part. Cemeteries are valuable resources to navigate beyond a stone's epitaph. We're going to discuss during this session cemeteries, the headstones, and the data we can collect from them. There's three areas to focus on. One is what condition and type of cemetery are you going to find. Two, some valuable techniques for collecting the data of those tombstones and the cemeteries themselves. And three, looking into those facts by analyzing the data that you find. Let's begin with the condition and type of cemetery that you may uncover whenever you arrive at the cemetery. Cemeteries can be in a variety of uh, stages and conditions and types and there's really no telling until you arrive. So do prepare for a variety if you have not been able to find out its condition before you arrive. It could be very preserved and hopefully this is what you find at the majority of the cemeteries you research. They'll be easy to navigate and hopefully easy to gather a lot of information that collected from stones and also from the cemetery grounds. Hopefully it is active, actively owned and they have an available record collection to assist you in your family history fact gathering. But do know, active cemeteries usually still have some level of privacy restrictions attached, so you may or may not be allowed to view those records. If it's a publicly owned cemetery, meaning if the city or local authorities have um, ownership of that land, then the records will likely be open other than protecting in living individuals. But if it is not and it's held in, in private hands and ownership, then those records are not public domain and you're at the mercy of those owners. But that's okay, there are a few ways to still fulfill and get around that uh, information you may need that you can't gather at the web, at the cemetery site. If you happen to come upon a neglected or, or cemetery just left in disarray, it can be more cumbersome to find that information. One, the land can be very overgrown, hard to navigate. It could also be um, not only abandoned, but mishandled where there could be a lot more chance of record loss. Unmarked plots, unmarked graves, undefined fence rows and such can be a lot to take in and gather, but do take note of that. And there are some ways to try to regain what might not be reachable. Here you have two examples, one a very active manicured cemetery and in a very inactive abandoned cemetery. Both in rural areas. One is adjacent to a common road for public access, the other on private land. Since we've touched on some of the occasions of how a cemetery is going to greet you, let's look at it some way we can to, you know, collect some of that data, no matter the condition. Let me take a moment just to mention some of the practices we will not be discussing when collecting cemetery information. Tombstone rubbings that you might see in a classroom setting, I do not promote. It does lead to fragility of stones 
and that's something that I think a digital camera can help um, navigate. <laughs> Chalking also damages the face of the stone and that is not going to be something that I will promote. And shaving cream, also very treacherous to uh, the lifespan of, of the headstones. So please, please, please reconsider the use of these and by all means, find another way. We have so much technology today that we don't have to do these. So let's go on to a few things that you can do and still have some very fruitful results. The first thing I recommend whenever you first step foot at the cemetery gates is to just stop and draw a simple map. Note the entrance of the cemetery if you can see your family plots from the distance, note that as well. Also, go ahead and mark down some of the details of areas around there. I like to do this for a finding aid. Sometimes it takes a while to remember where that cemetery was. For instance, years ago when I was young, about 20, 21, an older cousin took me to a very rural cemetery that housed a good portion of our family about five generations before us. Today, I know where that cemetery is, but quite a few years ago, we couldn't find it anymore. The town had completely envel enveloped that cemetery and we lost every bearing we had from back then. So once I did find it, <laughs> it took some traveling and some talking to other people and realized it was literally almost at my back door. It's just the environment completely changed my, my references. So if I would have originally made a map of where we entered the cemetery, how we got there, and not just focus on the actual cemetery itself, it would have actually really helped me as I saw that town expand and come back and visit later. An example of making sure I hand draw the access to the cemetery and where I navigated to the headstone. I also put in a couple important details. The date that I drew this map, made the cemetery visit, some cross points so I can identify how to return back. So I have several street avenues noted, 11th Street, Missouri Avenue, and Highway. And then I have another identifying point, which is a Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's very important today because in 2006, there was a Kentucky Fried Chicken building. Today, there is a building but it does no, it no longer resembles a Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's repainted, has different signs, and if you're not a local, you might not realize that was what was there. If you're not inclined to hand draw, that's okay. We have a lot of online resources. This here is an overview of Google Maps in 2020. <laughs> quite a few years later and quite a bit different. I made sure I identified the same areas that I did prior, and I also noted the building that still stands that no longer resembles a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Here's another example. There's my cemetery, and there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken building in circled. Another way to record is to photograph. And I like to make sure that I make written notations of the condition of the cemetery, the family plot, and each individual headstone. But I also photograph the same items, the area, the plot, and the headstone. Let me show you an example. Here I have three different views. One is the overview of the cemetery as I'm going to that section. Another one's when I get a little closer to the actual family plot. And then one third there is where I'm actually taking individual photos of each headstone. Using this example from a Negro cemetery in Person County, North Carolina, 
that I have located on the Library of Congress website. We're going to transcribe the headstones, any markings, note some items around this stone, anything that I might think is valuable to my research. If I'm going to use a digital recorder, I do want to say to spell out each name, each letter individually, if it is quite different than what we would expect to spell it as. As I'm going along and transcribing these headstones, I'm going to stop periodically and analyze my data, the facts, the findings that we're collecting. This is really going to help me while I'm still present at the cemetery to make sure I have captured the exact details the best way that I can in the best quality. As you move along the cemetery and collect all of this data, make sure you take a moment, analyze it, and review your notes. Don't forget to review your digital photos. If you're not as handy with the settings on your camera, you might have to retake some photos. It's easier to do it now than to have to return later. So let's come back to our Fanny B. Lawson here. After transcribing this headstone exactly the way I first interpreted it, and it kind of looks like born was B-O-N, D-E-C for December in 1897, and then died in November 1912. I will verify with if what I am reading on the inscription this first time around it's exactly what I see, and then try to find other documentation to help verify, uh, you know, these facts and identify this person. So here I also made some notations on the stone itself, and you can go quite in depth. The stone is handmade, and it's also inscribed. You can see quite a ways that they, they hand drew in the lettering. It shows quite a bit of wear and a lot of damage, but it's still, it's still together. And the surrounding, I could go further and write about the surrounding area. That red clay, it's very visible even in this black and white photo. And you can see that there are other slim um, um, stones that are also in the background and a lot of rock. So an aerial view or a, a larger view of the area could give a lot more detail than this, just this single photo. So that's where taking additional photos really comes in handy. As I start to review the items that I have collected on my note, note paper and in my digital camera, I'm going to start asking myself several questions. Does that headstone material, the style of the form of it, does it all correlate to the death date? That might seem a little strange to ask, but I want to know, is this an original headstone or was this made after death? Was this something made during the immediate time period of this person's death or is it present day? You do get a little confused on material types and we can't go into a large discussion right now, but do know that a lot of times we, in present day, go back and place headstones on family members' graves when they might not have been able to afford it back then. So little notations like that can also help you, help you identify living ancestors, living descendants, I'm sorry, of that deceased individual that might lead you to more family you might not have had a relationship with. A lot of this is cousins are out there waiting for us. As I'm researching and transcribing from this headstone, I'm going to identify any distinct markings, symbols, anything that's not uh, legible. And I got a few examples of symbols that you might want to take a look at. Symbols that are on headstones can be quite valuable and giving you a little bit more detail on that deceased individual. Some, like the Masons logo there on the top left, will show you that they had an organizational affiliation. On the top right, it's giving you an, a little bit of idea that the individual there could have been um, a deceased 
child or a young adult or someone that they considered quite innocent. Okay. The other uh, thing here at the bottom to take note of is when you have markers that identify a family plot section. Here we have an S for the last name Swink, and each corner of this plot noted all the individuals within that plot were for that family. Other symbols are quite useful to help identify who may also be buried in an individual's plot. Here on the left you have a male and female uh, uh, shaking hands. Also take a look at the cuffs of their sleeves. On the left you have a nice rounded bubble sleeve that would be symbolized of a wife and on the right you have a cuff that actually has the cuff button. So that's going to symbolize the male or the groom the husband. So that right there gives you an identifiable possibility that both the, the husband and wife are buried in this plot. On the right, you have two identifiable military stones, one for Union and one for Confederate. This right here is a very big clue that you have additional resources available to you if you look into military records databases. As we continue analyzing the data, I want to see how this person is related to anyone else around their plot. Do you see any other surname similar to this person's grave in another section, nearby, on the stone itself? I want to know if there are um, individuals in one family grouping, multiple families sharing this plot. So those type of details do make note of. Is a married couple with a maiden name. Many times the maiden name is lost for a lot of women and very few places might note it. A headstone may. So do keep note and ideas of what to look for when it comes to names and variations of such names. Now that you're gathering quite a bit of information from the stones, the cemetery and such, look and see do you have enough information to request vital records for any of these deceased individuals. I do have a name, a first name, a surname, <clears throat> and a given name. And I also have a date of death and a, at least years <laughs> of birth as well to look for Fanny Lawson in some vital record research if they're available. That is an early time period for a lot of localities, but it may be possible. I do not doubt until I actually go and check it out. FamilySearch.org has been a wonderful resource for finding vital records on the county level. And here I have gone to their um, North Carolina Vital Records, the wiki section that gives you a little bit more information on a locality in their table of contents as well but I want to look and see what might be available in North Carolina for Persons County in, in the way of vital records. So this is one area that I do search quite frequently to see not just what's available and survive, but what may be available on FamilySearch.org if not available at the local county courthouse. The FamilySearch Wiki is quite useful by navigating directly to a state and further allowing you to navigate directly to a specific county. Here the map is clickable but then so is the list of uh, counties that are right below it. Once you navigate to the specific county of your interest, 
do make sure you look at the county's information of current repositories. The wikis are quite useful in letting you know what's available, contact information, and what might be missing or did not survive. Now that I have a little information on Ms. Lawson, I'm going to go check on findagrave.com. That's a wonderful cemetery resource shared by a lot of great volunteers. It's noting death information, cemetery transcriptions, a large vast information to get you closer to finding vital records for your, for your ancestors. And it further narrows down right to the individual that you might locate. And here we have Fanny B. Lawson, quite similar to the information we found on the headstone. And then the actual name of the cemetery where she is buried. So using Miss Lawson as our example today, I'm able to look into a lot more information on not just Miss Lawson, but Person County, North Carolina, and also the church that was identified originally at the Library of Congress from the WPA um, uh, program, I do believe it might have been was the Negro Baptist Church. <laughs> okay, now we have a name. We have a name that we found her buried in and identified on Find a Grave. So I can add that information to my research and share that for others where we can help one another grow in, in what we're working on, our own projects. So to recap what we've gone over today, we've looked at gathering cemetery and headstone data by looking at the conditions and types of cemetery you may find. We discussed a few techniques to help you begin those stages of data collecting from headstones and cemeteries. And also a beginning of analyzing the data you collect and moving forward from the cemetery into record collections. Good luck with your research. I wish you well. The hobby of genealogy relies heavily on headstone inscriptions that are often the only source of information on ancestors' lives. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at leafseeker.com.